Disclaimer, this training may include content that is graphic and sensitive in nature. It may be triggering at times and make it difficult for you to participate. If you feel the need to excuse yourself, feel free to leave the room or take a break. Individuals such as those who've experienced a personal trauma that includes sex assault may reach out to the installation SAPR office to complete this training in a private setting to avoid furthering trauma or diminishing of emotional well-being. Remember, even if you don't have a personal experience, someone in this room might. For purposes of this training, the term victim will be used to align with policies. Statements should be respectful at all times. Please refrain from disclosing a sexual assault in this training so individual reporting options are preserved. Mandatory reporters are likely present. The SAPR office is available 24-7 for anyone who needs assistance. Welcome. In this SAPR training, we will discuss definitions, reporting options, resources, victims' rights, and the prevention of sexual violence. My name is Rosemary Cornett, licensed clinical social worker, sexual assault response coordinator here at Homestead Air Reserve Base, and this is my personal introduction. Some fun facts about me, I'm a first-generation Latina from the Miami area. We're a dual military household, and I am a mother of three. I believe in the empowerment, resilience, and strength of the SAPR program. I dedicate my position to serve as the 42nd Fighter Wing SARC to my family, my brother, my sons, daughter, and the future generations of military families to follow. I have this vision that we can one day raise our children to grow up in a world where sexual assault is no longer a taboo subject. You as emerging leaders play a role in that future. Preventing sexual violence is imperative to the mission of the Air and Space Force. Sexual assault is a violation of our core values and of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, known as the UCMJ. We're going to start with ensuring that we have a common understanding of some definitions. How would you define sexual assault and sexual harassment? What are some differences between sexual assault and sexual harassment? Sexual harassment is the unwelcome advances, gestures, comments, or repeated requests that are sexual in nature. Harassment has an impact to an individual's career and or can cause work environments to be uncomfortable or hostile. Sexual assault is the intentional and unwanted sexual touching or attempts to touch of another person when that person does not give or is not capable of giving consent. This is a SAPR definition of training and education. It does not affect the definition of any offense under the UCMJ. Sexual harassment includes gestures, words, or be physical, while assault must involve physical sexual contact. In the civilian courts, harassment is civil and assault is criminal. How do you define consent? How do you know when you have it? Consent, a freely given agreement to engage in sexual activities. This is a SAPR definition for training and education. It does not affect the definition of consent under the UCMJ. It is mutual between all parties involved. It must be obtained regardless of how a person is dressed or the past sexual history of or with that person. Consent cannot be given if someone is placed in fear, threatened, or incapable of giving consent. Some examples are saying yes, agreeing to sexual activity, having a discussion prior and or during sex, getting permission before engaging in sex. What role does alcohol play in getting and giving consent? Alcohol does not cause sexual assault. Alcohol is a substance that may alter an individual's ability to consent. Some offenders use alcohol as a tool to manipulate people into sexual activity and or excuse to justify their actions. Some examples are lower inhibitions, clouds judgment, 
can make consent complicated, can remove someone's ability to give consent. Who is eligible to file a report of sexual assault with the Sapper office? Military, their eligible family members who are 18 years or older, and U.S. Department of Air Force civilian employees where the assault did not involve a long-term romantic or domestic partner. Those reports should be made to the Family Advocacy Program. For Air National Guard, members will report in accordance with the National Guard Bureau policy and guidance. What are the differences between a restricted and unrestricted report? Restricted versus unrestricted reports. Both reports may be received by the SARC, SAPR VA, or healthcare personnel. Reports must be documented by signing a DD Form 2910 with a SARC or SAPR victim advocate. Restricted reports are kept confidential and neither command nor MCIO is notified by the SAPR, DOD Safe Helpline, or Military Medical. Unrestricted reports trigger a notification of the assault to command authorities and to MCIO or appropriate law enforcement investigative agencies, which may initiate an investigation. Both reports initiate support services. Additional support, like requesting an expedited transfer, are available only for unrestricted reports. Who may a victim speak with and maintain a restricted report? SARC, Victim Advocate, Chaplain Corps Personnel, Special Victims Council, Military Medical Providers, or Mental Health Providers. What is the difference between a disclosure and a report? A disclosure is the act of making a previously unknown sexual assault incident known. Victims can choose to disclose their assault to anyone, but need to be aware that disclosing to a mandated reporter may trigger an investigation. A report of sexual assault is the formal notification process to a government agency of the incident by electing to sign the DD Form 2910. Formally electing to report provides access to a variety of services for the victim. Disclosure is telling anyone. A report is official. An unrestricted report initiates an investigation. Who is a mandatory reporter and what must they do following a disclosure? Anyone in the victim's chain of command, for example, supervisors, supervisory chain, first sergeants, and commanders. Law enforcement, including security forces, Department of Air Force instructors, with the exception of USAFA instructors. If these mandatory reporters receive information about a sexual assault, they are required to report it to the MCIO. How does a disclosure to a mandated reporter change the reporting options for a victim? An independent investigation may be initiated. If a restricted report has already been made, the report remains restricted with the SAPR office unless or until the victim elects to convert to an unrestricted report. If the victim does not have a restricted befo report before the independent investigation begins, the victim is no longer eligible to file a restricted report with the SAPR office. What is an independent investigation? An independent investigation occurs when MCIO is investigating a sexual assault and the victim has not filed an unrestricted report or the victim is ineligible to file a report with the SAPR office. A third party, such as a friend of the victim, witness to assault, discloses the assault to a mandatory reporter. Personnel are not required to notify their commander or chain of command when speaking to the SAPR office. If someone is uncomfortable making an unrestricted report to command, say the alleged perpetrator is in the chain of command, where else can they go to report the assault? Someone else they trust in the chain of command or next senior commanding officer, SAPR personnel, Special Victims Council, MCIO or law enforcement, Inspector General, DOD Safe Helpline, Chaplain Corps personnel, medical or mental health. I want to highlight some details of a few of the resources that we just discussed. 
The sexual assault forensic exam or SAFE is the process of collecting any medical forensic evidence of the assault. It can be done even if the assault was non-penetrative. The sooner the evidence is collected, the better. But even if a victim has showered, gone to the bathroom, or it has been a few days since the assault, there is still possibly evidence that can be gathered. Members may also get tested for any STIs, receive preventative medications for STIs and or pregnancy, and get treatment for any injuries related to the assault. The CATCH program is open to any members who have filed a restricted report. They can anonymously and confidentially provide information about the offender and or the assault to MCIO. If the information provided matches another entry, like two different people identify the same offender, victims will be then notified by the SARC and offered the opportunity to convert their report to an unrestricted report. The Special Victims Council is a legal resource confidential for victims. They educate victims on their rights, provide legal consult, and may represent a victim in military court. Members can connect with an SBC through the Sapper office. Victims of sexual violence have certain rights under the UCMJ related to their case. What do you think some of those rights are? Treated with fairness and respect for their dignity and privacy. Be reasonably protected from the alleged offender. Express a preference on military or civilian prosecution. Provide input to the convening authority on the disposition. Receive notice of certain proceedings and events. Be present and heard at certain proceedings. Confer with the prosecutor and or trial counsel in the case. Receive restitution if available by law. Proceedings free from unreasonable delay. There's also the right to attend the hearings and or court trial. The right to feel safe. The right to testify. Victims also have the right to privacy. SAPA personnel, mental health, Chaplain Corps personnel, and SVCs all can maintain some degree of privileged communications with the victim about the assault. What is leadership's roles and responsibilities in supporting victims who report a sexual assault? Provide support within the work center, ensuring the victim's rights are protected, ensuring a victim's physical safety, emotional security, and medical treatment needs are met. Notifying the commander or director of any barriers to support. Victims have the opportunity to communicate with the GFO regarding issues related to their military career that the victim believes are associated with sexual assault. Protecting the victim and others involved from retaliation. Retaliation is when a member takes or threatens to take a negative personal action or wrongfully withhold or threatens to withhold favorable personal actions with the intent to retaliate against or discourage a person for reporting or planning to report a criminal offense or protect a communication. Retaliation includes reprisal to taking or threatening to take an unfavorable personal action or withholding threatening to withhold a favorable personal action related to the report of sexual assault. Ostracism is excluding a member from a previously accepted group or social presence after a member reports a sexual assault. Maltreatment is a treatment by peers or by others that may be abusive or unnecessary and done with the intent to discourage reporting or do administration of justice, and that results in, or could have caused, physical or mental harm or suffering. What are some examples of retaliation for reporting sexual assault? Giving someone a bad enlisted performance report, EPR, related to protected communication. Giving someone a letter of counseling, LOC, or letter of reprimand, LOR, related to protected communication, being excluded, made fun of, or mocked. Who can experience retaliation for a report of sexual assault? Victims, bystanders, peers or friends, supervisors, support personnel, including SARC, advocates, or SVCs. What are the resources and reporting options available for someone experiencing retaliation? The SARC or Victim Advocate, Special Victims Council, 
DOD's safe helpline, MCIO. Commander or a commander that is outside or higher up on the chain of command. IG reprisal only. I want to end by talking about what we all can do to prevent sexual violence. Can you explain the continuum of harm? Continuum of harm describes a range of behaviors which can lead to a sexual assault. These red dot behaviors start with inappropriate jokes, sexual gestures, sexual objectification, harassment, and inappropriate touching. What are some of the reasons we don't intervene when we see things occurring that fall along this continuum? Social barriers include when we see no one else is intervening or being concerned about how others will react. Personal barriers include being shy or distracted. Institutional barriers include rank structure, retaliation, institutional biases, or fear of law enforcement. The biases we have may also be barriers to intervening and prevention. Don't recognize the situation as harmful or risky. Shy, non-confrontational, or don't know what to do. What can you do to intervene when you see words, actions, or behaviors that fall along the continuum? Intervene directly. Engage with either the possible victim or possible aggressor. Intervene by delegating. Call for help or ask someone with more authority or a closer relationship with, a pe with the people involved to step in. Intervene by distracting from the situation until everyone is safe. Example responses. Ask the person being targeted if they are okay. Tell a supervisor or call 911. What is one thing you can do today or this week to help prevent sexual violence from occurring in the first place? Prevention includes increasing protective factors like setting norms that promote respect and creating a climate where sexual assault is less likely to happen. Three important norms help reduce sexual violence. Sexual assault would not be tolerated. Everyone deserves to be treated with respect. Everyone is expected to play a part in prevention. Share resources on social media. Talk to your kids about how to get and give consent. Listen to someone who needs support. Thank you for participating in today's training. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. The SAPRA office is the best resource for more information on sexual violence prevention and response. Welcome. In this suicide prevention training, we'll be focusing on connectedness and why it's important for the prevention of suicide. We'll discuss how to recognize and respond to distress, how you can use the ACE model to help someone in distress, including overcoming barriers, and how we can all be a part of a cultural change that supports help-seeking help and connectedness amongst airmen and guardians. Hi, I'm Veronica Sforza. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I, I am the Director of Psychological Health here at Homestead Air Reserve Base. I was born in Miami and joined the Air Force in 1982. When I finished active duty, I came back to Miami and joined the reserves here as a senior airman. I later retired from the reserves in late 2016 as a major. Having grown up in the Air Force and specifically here at Homestead Air Reserve Base, I recognize that the idea of people seeking mental health has begun to be seen as a positive thing, which is really important to our future. Helping our members find the way to find help and the help that they need, and then later learning that they are feeling better and doing better helps me see that the importance of the DPH program and that it is working. You, as an airman or a general or anything in between, as a civilian, you're an important part of our system, and mental health is, the vital, is vital to our well-being. So please, call me if you need my help. It's confidential. What does connectedness mean, and how can connectedness help prevent suicide? Connectedness means that people feel a sense of belonging. They feel seen and heard. You know that others care and will be there for them. 
Listening and being connected allows us to learn more about one another, recognizing changes in behavior and indicating someone is stressed or in distress, and work as a team to build up and support one another. When we feel connected to others, we have people we can reach out to in times of need or when distressed. For example, belonging, mutual cooperation. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. When someone is struggling, we acknowledge it and rely around and rally around them, insulating them versus isolating them. Be thoughtful and willing to listen to each other. Connectedness is a theme that we will be returning to throughout this training. It's more important for us to feel connected with one another, especially in stressful times. Building and maintaining meaningful connections with others can better prepare us to recognize the risk factors and warning signs that signal others are having problems and may need support. What is the difference between stress and distress? Stress is a normal part of our lives. Occasionally, stressors overwhelm us and our ability to cope and may result in symptoms and trigger a state of distress. Distress is a state of extreme anxiety, sadness, anguish, worry, sorrow, or emotional pain. Can you give me examples of healthy ways you cope with stress? Exercise, get more sleep, talk to a trusted friend. Know what happens when those healthy coping skills don't work? Stress could potentially turn into distress. Sometimes when we don't use coping skills early on, stress can build up and or stress can become overwhelming. It becomes so overwhelming that it leads to an immediate distress. Distress, it may be a gradual thing or it may result after a number of stressors building up. What risk factors and warning signs might we notice in someone who is struggling or in distress? Risk factors are characteristics or conditions that increase the chance that a person may consider, attempt, or die by suicide. Risk factors may include marital or relationship problems, workplace issues or legal problems, for example, receiving an LOR or an Article 15 or a DUI charge, money or financial problems, loss of a loved one, a pet, or being close to someone who has died by suicide, alcohol and drug use, significant life-altering events like moving, demotions, a job loss. Warning signs are usually visible behaviors that may indicate that someone is in distress and needs someone to check in with them. Warning signs may include talking about dying or suicide, misuse or abuse of alcohol or drugs, that's overusing at one time or repeated overuse, showing extreme mood swings, for example, extremely sad to calm or happy, any extreme behavior outside of the person's normal demeanor, withdrawal from family, friends, and withdrawal from activities that normally are enjoyed, posting concerning or troubling messages on social media. Recognizing risk factors and warning signs are key to being able to effectively intervene early on Help seeking is not a sign of weakness. It takes strength and courage to, ex to exercise self-improvement and to act responsibly. You don't need to have experienced a traumatic event to seek help. It's okay to seek support and get through everyday challenges. Proactively reach out to each other and be a source of help if you sense that, you, that they might need it. Before we talk about intervening, Let's step back for a moment and look at the bigger picture, the culture change we can foster to support prevention. I want you to imagine an environment where checking in with others and seeking help when you need it is as common as asking for help when your car breaks down. What role can we play in creating an environment like this? We need to support an environment where checking in with others and seeking help when we need it is common, encouraged, and normalized. Culture change comes through normalizing help-seeking behaviors and openly talking about mental and behavioral health. Wingman intervention skills, including applying the three Ds, direct, distract, delegate, are important for early intervention when someone may be showing signs of stress before they become overwhelmed or distressed. Barriers exist in applying the three Ds and at each step of ACE, which may make it difficult to effectively intervene. 
There are some ways to work through and go around these barriers, starting with becoming aware of them, so we can be there for others when they need us most. Some examples in this type of environment, we talk openly about mental health and seeking support from professionals. We frequently check in with each other and ask if everything is okay when someone seems stressed. We develop trust with our colleagues and feel comfortable asking for help. We do not minimize feelings and reactions and avoid blaming people for their own distress. We've talked about building connections to be in a position to recognize a change in someone, and we would like to see a culture where this is discussed and supported more. But if we need to intervene at some point, how can we do that? Intervention is an important step because without it, we continue to be bystanders, and sometimes the issue is never addressed. We use the ACE or the ACE model as a resource to assist in intervention. A stands for ask, C stands for care, and E stands for escort. Simply knowing the steps, however, does not mean that it is easy to have a conversation with someone you think may be having thoughts of suicide. Though we are presenting specific steps, this process is rarely clear cut. Applying the ACE model should flow like a conversation. We'll begin with ask and some of the barriers to this step. What are some of the barriers that may prevent you from asking someone about whether they are thinking about dying by suicide? What can you do to work around these barriers? Some common barriers are not knowing what to say or what to do if they say yes, feeling uncomfortable bringing up the subject of suicide, worrying that you are misinterpreting the situation, worrying that you may be planning the ideas of suicide, which has been debunked by research, think it, that it is not your business to get involved, worried they may become angry or upset if you ask. Now here's some of the ways we can address these barriers. First of all, think through what you're going to say ahead of time. Talk to someone you trust about your concerns and approach the person together. Consider the consequences of not intervening. What if that person really needs someone to check in with them? What are some examples of how you can approach and ask someone? Research conclusively shows that asking about thoughts of self-harm or suicide will not plant this idea or make the person suicidal. This is a myth that has been debunked. It's important to be direct and to ask if they are thinking about dying by suicide by saying things like, are you having thoughts about suicide? Or are you thinking about killing yourself? When you do this, avoid judgmental language. It's especially important that you demonstrate authentic concern using your own words. Here are some examples of ways to ask. Tell the person that you notice the changes in behavior or why you were concerned. Ask the question and remind the person that you care. I know others who have been in similar situations and thought about suicide. Have you thought about killing yourself? I notice you've been keeping to yourself or coming in work late, etc. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Have you wished you were dead or that you would go to sleep forever and never wake up? Additionally, if the reply is yes, ask, the person, ask if the person has access to tools of self-harm, such as weapons or over-the-counter and prescription medications, sharp objects, rope, etc. If someone gives an example that only includes asking about whether someone plans to harm themselves, emphasize that they need to follow up by asking directly about dying by suicide. Next, we'll discuss care. What do we mean when we talk about care? and what barriers may get in the way of showing someone that we do care. Care is showing empathy and being able to understand the emotions and feelings of another person. Care includes calmly expressing genuine concern for someone. Barriers to showing we care exist, and it's helpful to understand what our personal barriers are so that we can identify ways of showing that we care. Ask about and show concern for physical safety. Some example barriers are not knowing the person well, uncomfortable with the topic of suicide, not sure what to say or worried that, they'll say, that you'll say the wrong thing. What can we say and do to show someone that we care? Listening carefully to what the person is thinking and feeling. Don't try to fix it or solve their problems. Active listening is critical. Example, eye contact, verbal acknowledgement, non-judgmental paraphrasing, and validating their feelings. Avoid blaming or minimizing language such as, you're overreacting, or it's not really a big deal, or you should count your blessings. Ask if the person has tools that they could use for self-harm. For instance, weapons, over-the-counter prescription medications, 
sharp objects, rope, etc. Remember to go slow. Use safes, locks, or store lethal means outside of the home. Ask if you or someone they know can help by securing or removing any tools that may be used for self-harm. Now more examples. Make eye contact with the person. Use active listening such as paraphrasing, restating, or clarifying. Say, I care about you and your safety. I'm concerned about your well-being. Thank you for telling me this. You are a valued member of this team. I want to make sure that you're safe. Let's make sure your firearms or medication are safely stored. You could also ask, I want to be able to help. Can you tell me what's going on? What can I do to help? Would you like me to go with you to insert the resource? Do not talk about yourself or your problems. The last step in ACE is escort. In the short term, this means escorting the person to the next level of direct care or staying with them until help arrives. And resources for the next level of care include mental health or DPH, hospital emergency room, chaplain corps personnel, or simply calling 911. If appropriate, try to separate the person from tools of self-harm, such as weapons or over-the-counter and prescription medications, sharp objects, rope, etc. Do not, but do not, do not do so at the risk of your own safety. After you have escorted someone to a safe place, what follow-up should you do? What might get in the way of following up? Follow up with the person to see how they are doing, but have realistic expectations. We can't solve all their problems. But you can continue to show that you care. Don't avoid the person. Instead, show empathy. Ask them how and when they would like you to follow up and follow through on that plan. Check to see how they were doing and ask to see if they need anything. Access, access that they have any lethal means that are safely secured. Beyond following up with the person, how do you help them reintegrate back into the unit after or during treatment and counseling? How can you make someone feel welcomed and included after they've experienced thoughts of self-harm or a mental health challenge? Reintegration back into the unit after or during treatment or counseling is a critical step for increasing and maintaining corrected connectedness. Let the person guide what they want to share or not share and empower them. An example, I know you've had a rough time and I'm glad you're here. What do you need from me? How can I help support you? It may feel awkward or intimidating to approach someone and ask them directly about suicide, but by directly asking, caring, and escorting, you are supporting them and may even be saving their life. Now think back to our conversation earlier about creating an environment in which everyone feels a sense of connectedness and belonging and is comfortable share, or checking in and asking for help. What makes you feel connected to others? What can you do to help others feel connected and like they belong? Connectedness and belonging help foster protective, supportive environments which increase resilience before, during, and after stressful events. Connectedness also helps you recognize signs of stress, distress early on in others as well as ourselves. Self-awareness is important to seeking help for ourselves when we are struggling. Utilize coping strategies that increase personal resilience. We must take care of ourselves in order to help and be able to take care of our team. What makes you feel connected to others? Having someone ask how you're doing, having someone remember your name, pronouncing it correctly, or share hobbies you like. When they express interest in your thoughts and opinions, what can you do to help others feel connected and that they belong? Remember names. Ask about their interests and hobbies. If someone seems isolated, ask them how they are doing or invite them to socialize. Ask someone for their opinion on something or how they uh, value their opinion, how you value their opinion. We do not necessarily have to share interests or common backgrounds to build connectedness. Find ways you are comfortable connecting with others. There are many different and creative ways to build connectedness and a sense of belonging. This concludes the Emerging Leader Training. Please review the attached or local 
and local and base resources. Should you need any help, please do not hesitate to call.